Hey Bozo, it's hard to simulate the real world. From the strands of hair on your balding head, to the furniture and buildings you walk past each and every day, throughout your life you'll see and fondle millions of objects. And throughout your life, you'll never have to worry about storage space or FPS. The real world can handle physics interactions en masse because each and every object manages itself. Conversely, it's difficult for computers to emulate real life because every little thing has to be stored and controlled manually. It's like trying to line up a thousand adults versus a thousand toddlers. Unlike me, you might not think about toddlers often, but let me tell you, this task is monumental. And like me, physics simulation only gets harder the more kids there are. In the pursuit for more realistic environments and more interesting gameplay, the number of objects in a game got greater. Nowadays, it isn't uncommon for levels to contain hundreds or even thousands of actors, making our task exponentially more difficult. You see, if you want to determine whether two objects are hitting or overlapping, you need to check them against one another, to compare things like their location, their size, their shape, and orientation. To do this for a whole scene of objects, you need to assess every possible object pair, an operation that gets more tedious as the object count rises. For example, with two objects, there's one possible object pair. With 10 objects, there are 45 possible pairs. And with a thousand objects, there are almost half a million pairs to check. To be fair, computers have gotten a lot more powerful, but not strong enough to brute force check every single pair in a reasonable amount of time. Remember, these operations have to be done every frame. If we want to have a playable game with a smooth frame rate, our physics simulation, with its hundreds of thousands of comparisons and calculations, has to happen in a tiny fraction of a second. Even less when you factor in other processes like rendering, AI pathing, and game logic. If our computers cannot handle complex scenes with many objects in a reasonable amount of time, our games will be so laggy that they will be unresponsive. Or worse, turn-based. Now the question is, how can we optimize such a process? Uma Musume, Pretty Derby. No, this is not an ad, just an addiction. To address scenes with many objects, modern games have taken a two-step approach. These steps are called the broad phase and the narrow phase. In horse racing, there are two ways one can determine the winner. The first is by eye. We can physically see that the horse is far and away from the other horses. The second is used only when it's a close race, one with what they call a photo finish. Here, the winner is determined through a high-speed camera. Slower, yes, but a lot more precise. The two phases follow a similar principle. The broad phase does rough calculations that the computer can do quickly and easily, aiming to reduce the workload of the narrow phase, a process that is a lot more accurate, but slower. The more pairs we can filter out in the broad phase, the quicker the overall process is. In scenes with many objects, or just in modern games in general, broad face algorithms play a massive role in making collision detection quick and the overall game playable. This video will focus on broad face algorithms. I'll be trying to explain four different methods in a way that non-programmers can understand, go over their benefits as I see them, and then finish off by comparing them against one another. Yay! The brute force algorithm looks at every object, and compares it against every other object. It doesn't reduce the number of collision pairs, so I'm not counting it as one of the four methods. In saying that, it's still pretty useful, acting as our baseline or control. Earlier, to calculate the number of object pairs in a scene, I used the equation n multiplied by n minus 1 divided by 2, where n is the number of objects in the scene. Normally, I would omit or simplify such a calculation, because that's the sort of thing that would cause people to click off the video. But there's a really intuitive way to explain it. That, and I want to reach 8 minutes for the mid-roll app. Let's take the thousand object scene as an example. To start off, pick one of the objects in the scene. With a thousand objects to choose from, there are a thousand possible choices for the first selection, giving us our n. Next, pick a different object in the scene. Since we cannot compare an object against itself, there is one less, or 999 possible choices for the second selection, giving us our n minus 1. Lastly, the piece of resistance, the divide by 2. Let's take a look at this pair of objects. 
I can get this pair either by selecting the left one first and then the right, or the right one first and then the left. Since there are two ways to get the same pair, we divide by two. Attenta viewers probably noticed this, but my showcase of the brute force algorithm had this same problem. These two pairs compare the same two objects. Going back to our scene of a thousand objects, 1000 possible first choices multiplied by 999 second choices, then finally half to account for duplicate pairs, gives us 499,500, or half a million. <sighs> I'm, I'm about to blow. The sweep and prune method is named after its approach. We sweep through the scene and prune out unnecessary pairs. This method takes advantage of one fact, that two overlapping actors must overlap from all directions. So it picks a direction and green lights all pairs that overlap from that perspective. Imagine looking out the window during a train ride and seeing these three trees. Which ones are touching? If you said these two, you're wrong. If you're wrong, don't feel bad because I phrased my question to purposefully mislead you into thinking that two trees had to be touching. I wanted to create intrigue by subverting your expectations, and because of my trickery, being incorrect was the expected outcome. So again, do not feel bad. When applied to the tree example, the algorithm would have picked the same two trees as the morons that got it wrong. It was checking objects against this direction, and as you saw, those trees overlap from that perspective. This highlights the main weakness of this approach, that an overlap in one dimension still leaves a massive amount of space in the other dimensions. Because of this, it's better suited for 2D games, as the fewer dimensions there are, the more accurate the sweep and prune method becomes. I'm pretty sure that GameMaker, the engine behind Undertale and Pirate Software, uses the sweep and prune method. The advantage of this algorithm is in organization. By organizing objects in one direction, we know exactly when to stop. Just like the brute force method, we compare everything against everything else. But as soon as we find something that is too far away, we know that everything after is invalid since everything after is even farther away. Spatial partitioning splits the world into chunks, sort of like Minecraft. Imagine that you and I are in an apartment building holding hands. This is only possible if you and I share the same apartment. Conceptually, spatial partitioning follows the same line of reasoning. It splits the level into sections and performs the brute force method on each section. Stepping away from real life, objects in this method can overlap with multiple apartments, so we usually size each section large enough to comfortably envelop all of the objects in a scene, barring massive actors like the terrain. The cool thing about spatial partitioning is that it can elegantly handle scenes that are infinitely large. To do this, it doesn't actually spawn cubes everywhere, in fact it doesn't spawn cubes at all. To understand this, let's take out a number line and select a random number. You probably know of rounding, where you select the closest number. What we'll do is sort of similar, we are going to floor, that is, selecting the closest number less than it, basically rounding down. I want you to stop and think about what that does as you increase the number of points. Looking at it, it kind of slurps each section on the number line. Doing this for all three dimensions, you can see how this method creates each section without spawning in boxes. I don't want to explain how the flooring math works with larger partition sizes or how spanning multiple sections would work, so I'd like to outsource that labor to the commenters. Octrees, like the previous method, splits the levels into sections. It doesn't space things out evenly, however, instead recursively bisecting space into smaller and smaller sections. Like a 3D fractal, the cube is repeatedly split into eight smaller cubes, hence the oct part of octrees. The tree part comes from the ownership of each section. Larger sections own the smaller sections that make them up just like how each branch on a tree owns the smaller branches that branch off from that branch. Using the apartment building example, this method is like splitting up the building into floors, splitting each floor into apartments, and splitting each apartment into rooms. The advantage this approach has is that we can focus our efforts where they are needed most. You don't need to build rooms everywhere if the entire floor houses only one tenant. 
We only need to split things up when things get too crowded. The octree method includes things one by one. When a section contains too many entities, we split it, rinsing and repeating until all objects are included. By doing this, you can see how we concentrate our efforts to match the concentration of objects. In the same way that we arbitrarily select section size and spatial partitioning, we choose the amount of entities allowed in a section before splitting, and the maximum number of splits we can do. How many splits can you do? Bounding volume hierarchies, like octrees, repeatedly splits the level into smaller and smaller volumes. It differs from octrees in three ways. It doesn't necessarily split the level evenly, there isn't a limit to the number of times it will split, and third point here. Imagine you and I were placed in a building somewhere in the world. This algorithm sort of works like an address. First comparing the country, then comparing the city, then the street, and finally the house number. If at any point your value and mine are different, we know that we are in different buildings. The advantage of this method is in its efficiency. If we know that you are in America, we can instantly rule out every object that is not in America. If we know that you are in Chicago, we can instantly rule out every object that is not in Chicago. If you live in Chicago, or if you like toes, comment down below. This efficiency makes this algorithm lightning fast even when compared to other broad phase methods, which is why major game engines like Unreal Engine, the engine behind Fortnite, and Unity, the engine behind Cuphead, use this method. I'll be honest, like many of my videos, this one is just a repackaged school assignment. For it, I made a program to benchmark the speed and efficiency of each algorithm, and from my findings, I made the following statements about each algorithm. Bounding volume hierarchies is the most effective method in most, if not all, scenarios. Octrees provide a competitive alternative to bounding volume hierarchies, providing similar results, albeit with greater setup. Spatial partitioning is good for large, sparsely populated environments, but its performance drops when object count and concentration increases. Sweep and prune is a lightweight, easy to implement method that is suitable for lightly to moderately dense scenes. And the brute force method is valuable as a control benchmark, but impractical for most cases. And that's it. To the brainazoids in the comments, uh, please let me know if I was wrong in any of my statements. I'm a little homunculus, so I imagine it was a lot. But keep in mind that I had to simplify and omit some things to make things more digestible in video form. Please like and subscribe, and thank you for watching. Later, bozo.